Only because of him do the material universe. Temporarily manifested by the reaction to the three modes of nature. Temporarily manifested by the reaction to the three modes of nature. Appear factual, although they are unreal. Appear factual, although they are unreal. And therefore meditate upon him, Lord Sri Krishna. Are therefore meditated upon him, Lord Sri Krishna. Who is eternally existent in the transcendental abode. Who is eternally existent in the transcendental abode. Which is forever free from the illusory representations of the material world. Which is forever free from the illusory representation of the material world. I meditate upon him, for he is the absolute truth. I meditate upon him, for he is the absolute truth. Dharma Prajita Kaitra Votra. Dharma Prajita Kaitra Votra. Paramo Nirmata Saranam Satam. Paramo Nirmata Saranam Satam. Vedyam Vastavam Atra Vastu. Vedyam Vastavam. Shivadam tapa trayon mulanam. Shivadam tapa trayon mulanam. Shimad Bhagavate Mahamuni Krite. Shimad Bhagavate Mahamuni Krite. Kimba Parir Ishwaraha. Kimba Parir Ishwaraha. Sadhya Vridhi Avarudya Tetra. Sadhya Vridhi Avarudya Tetra. Kriti Vihi Shushu Shubhistakshanat. Kriti Vihi Shushu Shubhistakshanat. Completely rejecting all religious activities which are materially motivated. Completely rejecting all religious activities which are materially motivated. This Bhagavata Purana propounds the highest truths. Bhagavad Puran propounds the highest truth, which is understandable by those devotees who are fully pure in heart. Which is understandable by those devotees who are fully pure in heart. The highest truth is reality distinguished from illusion for the welfare of all. The highest truth, the reality distinguished from illusion for the welfare of all. Such truth uproots the threefold miseries. Such truth uproots the threefold miseries. This beautiful Bhagavatam compiled by the great sage Vyasadeva in his maturity. This is a beautiful Bhagavatam compiled by the great sage Vyasadeva in his maturity. It's sufficient in itself for God realization. It's sufficient itself for God realization. What is the need of any other scripture? What is the need of an other scripture? As soon as one attentively and submissively hears the message of Bhagavatam. As soon as one attentively, submissively hears the message of Bhagavatam. By this culture of knowledge. By this culture of knowledge. The Supreme Lord is established within his heart. The Supreme Lord is established within his heart. Nigamak kalpataror galitam phalam. Sukamukad amrita dravya samyutam. Sukamukad amrita dravya samyutam. Vibhata bhagavatam rasam malayam. Vibhata bhagavatam rasam malayam. Muhur aho rasika bhuvi bhavukaha. Muhur aho rasika bhuvi bhavukaha. O expert and thoughtful man, relish shimad bhagavatam. O expert and thoughtful man, relish shimad bhagavatam. The mature fruit of the desire tree of Vedic literature. The mature fruit of the desire tree of Vedic literature. It emanated from the lips of Sri Sukadeva Goswami. It emanated from the lips of Sri Sukadeva Goswami. Therefore, this fruit has become even more tasteful. Therefore, this fruit is coming more tasteful. Although its nectarine juice was already relishable for all. Although its nectarine juice was already relishable for all. Including liberated souls. Including liberated souls. Shrimvatam Swakata Krishna. Shrimvatam Swakata Krishna. Punya Shravana Kirtana. Punya Shravana Kirtana. Iriyantak. Stohi Abhadrani, Riyanta Stohi Abhadrani, Vidu Nati Suhit Satam, Vidu Nati Suhit Satam. To hear about Krishna from Vedic literature, to hear about Krishna from Vedic literature, or to hear from him directly through the Bhagavad Gita. 
I have my interest to prove my Vedita. Is it self-righteous activity? It is self-righteous activity. And for one who hears about Krishna. And for one who hears about Krishna. Krishna who is dwelling within everyone's heart. Lord Krishna is dwelling within everyone's acts heart. Acts as the best wishing friend. Acts as the best wishing friend. And purifies friend. the devotee who constantly engages in hearing of him. And purifies the devotee who is constantly engaged in hearing of him. Nastapreshu bhadreshu. Nastapreshu bhadreshu. Nityam bhagavata sevaya. Nityam bhagavata sevaya. Bhagavati uttam. Bhagavati Uttama Sloki Bhakti Bhavati Nastiki In this way, a devotee naturally develops his dormant transcendental knowledge. In this way, the devotee naturally develops his dormant transcendental knowledge. As he hears more about Krishna from the Bhagavatam, as he hears more about Krishna from Bhagavatam, and from the devotees, and from the devotees, he becomes fixed in the, in the devotional service of the Lord. He becomes fixed in the devotional service of the Lord. <coughs> By development of devotional service. By development of devotional service. One becomes freed from the modes of passion and ignorance. One becomes freed from the mode of passion and ignorance. And thus Material lust and avarice are diminished. And as material lust and avarice are diminished. Evam prasana manaso. Evam prasana manaso. Bhagavat bhakti yogataha. Bhagavat bhakti yogataha. Bhagavat tattva vijnanam. Bhagavat tattva vijnanam. Mukta sangasya jayate. Mukta sangasya jayate. When these impurities are wiped away. When these impurities are wiped away. The candidate remains steady in his position of pure goodness. The candidate remains steady in his position of pure goodness. He becomes enlivened by devotional service. Become enlivened by devotional service. And understands the science of God perfectly. And understand the science of God perfectly. Vidyate Hridaya Granti. Vidyate Hridaya Granti. Chidyante Sarva Samsaya. Vidyante Sarva Samsaya. Chidyante Sasya Karmani. Chidyante Sasya Karmani. Drusta Evat Manishwari. Drusta Evat Manishwari. Thus Bhakti Yoga serves the hard knot of material affection. That's the Bhakti Yoga service, the hard knot of material and affection. And enables one to come at once to the stage of a samsayam samagram. And enables one to come at once to the stage of samsayam samagram. Understanding of the supreme absolute truth, personality of Godhead. Understanding the supreme absolute truth, personality of Godhead. Therefore, only by hearing from Krishna or from his devotees. Therefore, only by hearing from Krishna and from his devotees. In Krishna consciousness. In Krishna consciousness. Can one understand the science of Krishna? Can one understand the science of Krishna? Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 1, Chapter 17, Verse number 34. 34. Huh? 34. Yeah, yeah, I said that. I said that. Thank you for telling me. <laughs> Yasmin Harir Bhagavan Ijamana. Yasmin Harir Bhagavan Ijamana. Ijat Mamurti Yajatam Samlantanuti. Ijat Mamurti Yajatam Samtanuti. Kamam Amogan Stira Jangamanam. Kamam Amogan Stira Jangamanam. Antar Bahir Vayur Ivaisha Atma. Antar Bahir Vayur Ivaisha Atma. In all sacrificial ceremonies, although sometimes a demigod is worshipped, the Supreme Lord, personality of Godhead, is worshipped because he is the super soul of everyone and exists both inside and outside like the air. Thus, it is he only who awards welfare to the worshiper. Purport of his divine grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada. It is, it is even sometimes seen that demigods like Indra and Chandra are worshipped and offered sacrificial awards. Yet the rewards of all such sacrifices are awarded to the worshiper by the Supreme Lord. And it is the Lord only who can offer all welfare to the worshiper. The demigods, although worshipped, cannot do anything without the sanction of the Lord because the Lord is the super soul of everyone, both moving and non-moving. In Bhagavad Gita 9.23, the Lord himself confirms this in the following sloka. 
Yepi anya devata bakta yajante shadayan vitaha tepimam eva konteya yajantia vidi purvakam. Whatever a man may sacrifice to other gods, O son of Kunti, is really meant for me alone, but it is offered without true understanding. The fact is that the Supreme Lord is one without a second. There is no God other than the Lord himself. <coughs> Thus, the Supreme Lord is eternally transcendental to the material creation. But there are many who worship the demigods like the sun, the moon, the in, and Indra, who are only material representations, representatives of the Lord. These demigods are indirect qualitative representations of the Supreme Lord. A learned <coughs> scholar or devotee, however, knows who is who. Therefore, he directly worships the Supreme Lord and is not diverted by the material qualitative representations. Those who are not so learned worship such qualitative material representations, but their worship is unceremonious because it is irregular. Srila Prabhupada Patita Bhavan and Kiche. So now you might ask the question, wow, this is unbelievable. You mean, there are hundreds and millions of people doing something that is not actually bona fide? Well, uh, it's partially bona fide, but it's not effective. What do you mean it's not effective? I see these people worshiping Shiva or Mata, and they're becoming prosperous. They're opening up one subway st uh, store after another. Yeah, but what are they doing in the subway store? They're selling meat. So. Okay, well, maybe they're not doing that, but they have these gra gas stations also. Yes, but in the gas station, they also have a shop that sells beef jerkies and sausages and lottery tickets and cigarettes. Okay, okay, but there are others, uh, there are some of them are uh, like big CEOs of companies. Yes. That may be, but they are also in companies that manufacture armament or manufacture pornography or manufacture this or manufacture that. See? So uh, you, you have to understand that by worshiping demigods, one cannot be liberated from the cycle of birth and death. But one can maybe have a little bit of prosperity, but a lot of karma that goes along with it. And whatever good things you're destined to get by that worship, you have to take birth again also to continue getting those things. So it's not a deal. It's, it's basically, it's a uh, disaster for people who do that. And we refuse to understand what is the truth. So therefore the truth is explained. For example, in the seventh chapter, it says, it's about, uh, those whose intelligence has been stolen by material desires surrender unto demigods and follow the particular rules and regulations of worship according to their own natures. So someone who is attracted to demigod worship, and there's so many demigods, there's over 33 million you need that many to manage the universe. Right? They're in charge, uh, they're, they're mandated agents of Krishna, and they're in charge of the air, the wind, the, uh, the rain, the sun, the moon, the movements of the planets, all these things are managed. Your digestion and your stomach, all these things are managed by these demigods. Just like in the city of Sammamish, you have approximately four or five hundred employees of the city. Why do they have so many employees? They're necessary for managing the city. In the city of, of uh, Seattle, you have uh, 10,000 employees of the city. Those are little cities, right? But they need so many people, if you count the fire department, the health department, the police department, the uh, uh, judicial department, all these things, and the, and the politicians themselves it comes out to a large number of people that are necessary to manage your city. Okay, well how about manage the universe? How many people do you think it's re required to manage the universe? Right? You have to have managers. 
Well, there's at least 33 million. So these are mandated agents to, that have been appointed by Krishna. But people think that those mandated agents are uh, somewhat independent gods. Well, that's a mistake. Krishna says that he is the supreme personality of Godhead. Arjuna says Krishna is the supreme personality of Godhead. Bhisma says, Bhisma Pitamala says, Krishna is the supreme personality of Godhead. Narada Muni says, Krishna is the supreme personality of Godhead. Lord Brahma says, Krishna is the supreme personality of Godhead. That Yamaraj says that Krishna is the supreme personality of Godhead. Lord Shiva says that Krishna is the supreme personality of Godhead. All the Mahajans and so many other great personalities like the Alvars in South India and so many great personalities like Ramanujacharya, Yamunacharya, and so many have all said that Krishna is the supreme personality of Godhead. So as long as people think that they can go to the mandated agents, well, why do they want to do that? Because they know if I go to Krishna, I won't get what I want. Uh, but what do you want? I want more sense gratification. And Krishna doesn't give that. But the demigods do. That's the way people think. They think, oh, if I have Bhagavad Gita in my house, they will be arguing and defending. <laughs> so I don't want a Bhagavad Gita. And they think, why should we go to Krishna? He was philandering. He had 16,000 wives. What's wrong with him? Let me worship Lord Rama, or let me worship this one or that one, because I don't want to worship someone who's a philanderer. Well, he's not a philanderer. You just don't know the actual facts. So, therefore, ignorance is the cause of suffering. And the people who refuse to accept knowledge of, from Krishna directly through the Bhagavad Gita, and this, these verses are in the Bhagavad Gita, yo yo yam yam phanum bhakta sradayarchitam ichyate tasya chalam sradham tamay vabhidadam yaham. Krishna says, I am in everyone's heart as the super soul. As soon as one desires to worship some demigod, I make his faith strong or I make his faith steady so that he can devote himself to that particular deity. Well, this is the problem. Man proposes, God disposes. Everything depends on what our desires are, what's going on in our mind. If we desire some material benediction, and we hear that if you go to Ganapati, he can bless you with riches. If you go to Matadi or Durga Mata, you can get uh, so many other material benefits and so forth. You can worship her as Uma Devi, you can get a beautiful wife, or you worship Katyayani, you can get a handsome husband. So when they hear these things, they think, ah, I shouldn't go to Krishna. He won't give me all these things. I'll go to the demigods. And therefore, Krishna makes their faith steady. And what happens? They might get what they want, but along with that, they get, some, they get karma also that keeps them bound up in the, in the modes of material nature and in the cycle of birth and death. So it's actually a condemnation it's like a curse, all those benedictions. Just like many people win the lottery. And what happens to them? If you follow the lives of people who have won the lottery, the majority of them have ruined their life by getting so much money at one time. Is that true or false? Have you ever read, of, have you ever read about things like that? Yes. Okay. Have you ever read something like that, probably? No. You don't read that much, probably. <laughs> <laughs> you don't read nonsense that much, that's right. <laughs> Anybody else ever hear, hear about that? Yes, yes? You want to relate one incident? That yeah, a few years back I heard a story that somebody won two million. Sorry. Yeah, a few years back I heard a story where some Indian guy in the U.S. got two million dollars and next day he, wa he was murdered. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, <laughs> terrible. In India? Here, yes. Wow, India is a dangerous place. Yeah. Was it Bihar? No, 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 in the U.S., I said. Oh, in the U.S. Yeah. Okay. I, I don't know. It's a few years back. Okay. Yeah, so uh, getting these type of material benedictions is not actually a good thing because it just increases your attachment 
to staying in the material world. And there's a law of nature, just like there's a law of gravity, right? There's a law of nature that says that the more one is, attra one is attached to material pleasures, material pleasures are always accompanied by material misery. This is fifth chapter, verse 22, Bhagavad Gita. In the purport, Prabhupada explains, the more one is addicted to material pleasures, the more he is entrapped by material miseries. Just like, for example, there was this one man from Ireland who came to the United States for a vacation. And he landed in New York City, and he was walking down uh, Broadway where there's so many lights and theaters and a lot of people walking around. It's a very animated place. And as he was walking down the street, this is the first or second day he arrived in the United States, some pretty girl walked by at him and passed him and smiled. And he stopped and smiled at her. And he said, oh, you know, I come from Ireland. And she said, oh. I like Irish people. <laughs> and so they had a, they started up talking and talking, and then he said, well, where are you going anywhere now? I said, no, not really. He said, would you, would you like to go to dinner? He said, oh, yeah, thank you. So they went to dinner. One thing led to another, and she, she stayed in his hotel room that night, and when he woke up, she wasn't there. But he saw, written on the wall above the bed, welcome to the world of age. He didn't understand what, exactly what that was. Mm -hmm. But when he went back to Ireland, he got a blood test, and he had AIDS. Mm -hmm. see. So that ecstasy turned into what? Mm -hmm. Misery. One minute of happiness, a lifetime of misery. And what kind of happiness is it anyway? It's, it's all superficial. So you see, uh, aiming for sense gratification can be very, very dangerous. I can tell you a thou thousands of stories of people, young people mostly, who went for sense gratification and it ended up in a tragedy. So, unless we learn to control the senses, we will always, it will always be accompanied by misery. This is a law of nature, like the law of gravity. We just read it. So, therefore it says, Sataya shradaya yuktas tasya radhanam ihute. Labbate cha tata kamam maya evabhi hitan hitan. Endowed with such a face in a demigod, the person endeavors to worship a particular demigod and obtains his desires. But in actuality, these benefits are bestowed by me alone. So, therefore, the result of that is, Krishna says, Antavattu falam te sam tad bhavati alpa medasam. Devan deva yojo yanti mad bhakta yanti mam api. Men of small intelligence worship the demigods, and their fruits are limited and temporary. Those who worship the demigods go to the planets of the demigods, but my devotees ultimately reach my supreme planet. So what does that mean? Well, that's explained in further in the ninth chapter of Bhagavad Gita. So we were just reading from the seventh chapter. When we go to the ninth chapter, we're going to find out some more shocking news. What is the shocking news? It's about the, uh, the Ferris wheel syndrome. What is the Ferris wheel syndrome? It's explained in two verses, 9.20 and 9.21. Those who study the Vedas and drink the Soma juice, seeking the heavenly planets, worship me indirectly. Purified of sinful reactions, they take birth on the pious heavenly planet of Indra, where they enjoy godly delights. When they have thus enjoyed vast heavenly sense pleasure, and the results of their pious activities are exhausted, they return to this mortal planet again. Thus, those who seek sense enjoyment by adhering to the principles of the three Vedas achieve only repeated birth and death. So that's called the Ferris wheel syndrome. The Ferris wheel goes up, and the little kitty is happy. The Ferris wheel comes down, and the little kitty, oh, no, I don't want to get off. Then it goes up again, and he's happy. It comes down again, and he's afraid of getting off and, and not being in the Ferris wheel. 
So that's what happens to us. Being tricked by false information, we think that we can get all our material benefits in life by going to the demigods. And if you don't get them, then you go to Microsoft. And if you don't get it there, you go to Amazon. If you don't get it there, you, you rob a bank. And, and if you end up in prison, then you do this or you do that. See? So actually, you're getting deeper into prison by trying to gratify material sense uh, enjoyments. Now, does that mean you have to be miserable the rest of your life? No. There is superior uh, transcendental pleasure that you can experience through Krishna consciousness by controlling the senses and the mind and directing them to Krishna through Krishna consciousness, chanting, dancing, feasting, all happy things. Like what, what do people do on Thanksgiving? They eat more, sometimes they sing, and they dance, right? Or they go somewhere where they can sing and dance, like a bar where they can drink and they get a little bit dizzy and start dancing and talking nonsense, more nonsense than normal. So, yeah, but we don't need alcohol, we don't need wine, we don't need marijuana. We have the holy name of Krishna, we have Mahaprasadam, and we have the beautiful sight of the deities, and we have, uh, and you can dance to your heart's, uh, to the end of your heart's wishes, simply in kirtan. So, we, our yoga system is singing, feasting, and dancing. And it's all scientific. The more you sing or chant Hare Krishna, the more you dance for the pleasure of the deities, the more you respect prasadam, the more you become purified, and with purified mind and senses, you begin to experience transcendental ecstasy. You begin to see Krishna and to uh, re receive the mercy of Krishna through his protection, and then you see that everything you do in life, as long as it's directed toward pleasing Krishna, it becomes successful. Becomes successful. Everything you do becomes successful. So isn't that what people want? They want to be happy. They want to have love. They want to have peace. They want to have success. You don't get it through material activities, through sense gratification, because there's a law of nature. Now, someone says, well, how do I know that's fact? Well, do you know that gravity is a fact? What goes up comes down? Yes. Well, this is also a fact. This is a, this is a fact of nature that, now why is that? Because Krishna teaches people in two ways. One well, first way, he comes and speaks the Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita is the ultimate wisdom. And we read something yesterday, I'm gonna read it again, so we understand. If you're looking for wisdom, wisdom means knowledge by which you can avoid all suffering in life. So on page 14 of the introduction of Bhagavad Gita, Prabhupada writes, 14 and 15, he says, the Bhagavad Gita is the essence of all Vedic knowledge. Vedic knowledge is not a question of research. Our research work is imperfect because we are researching things with imperfect senses. We have to accept perfect knowledge which comes down as is stated in Bhagavad Gita by the parampara disciplic succession. We have to receive knowledge from the proper source in disciplic succession beginning with the supreme spiritual master, the Lord himself, Krishna, who is the original spiritual master, and handed down to a succession of spiritual masters. Arjuna, the student who took lessons from Lord Sri Krishna, accepts everything he says without contradicting him. One is not allowed to accept one portion of Bhagavad Gita and not another. No, we must accept Bhagavad Gita without interpretation, without deletion, and without our own whimsical participation in the matter. The Gita should be taken as the most perfect presentation of Vedic knowledge. Vedic knowledge is received from transcendental sources and the first words were spoken by the Lord himself. So here we see that Bhagavad Gita is the supreme text of wisdom. Wisdom is that knowledge by which you can avoid all suffering and attain peace and happiness and satisfaction. Whereas by engaging in self, uh, 
indulgence, meaning sense gratification for a selfish purpose, all you get is dissatisfaction because sense gratification is always followed by misery. That's the law of nature. Now, someone will say, oh, I never heard that before. Okay, but you just heard it. So, uh, and it's not something that's made up. Fifth chapter, 22nd verse, and many other places, uh, Krishna explains it. So Krishna teaches us in two ways. One, by delivering the Bhagavad Gita. So he spoke it to Arjuna 5,000 years ago, and we still have it today. And by the mercy of Srila Prabhupada, we have Bhagavad Gita as it is, not as someone wanted it to be. If you're hearing the same Bhagavad Gita today in this translation by Srila Prabhupada that Arjuna heard 5,000 years ago. That's why when people read Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita as it is, most people become devotees because this is what happens if you've re actually read Bhagavad Gita. If you read Bhagavad Gita and you don't become a devotee, you didn't actually read it. You read some facsimile of it but you didn't actually read the real Bhagavad Gita. Okay, so then the second way t Krishna teaches people is by Maya. Maya is an agent of the Lord, and she uh, is in, in control uh, of the material nature and she, because she's acting on behalf of Krishna. And what does Maya do? When you come to Maya, like so many people worship Durga in India, and even in the United States. There, you know, there are temples of Durga in the United States also. So what do they do? They pray to the Maya or to Durga, give me this and give me that. Dhanam dehi, janam dehi, rupam dehi, uh, and so forth. Give me money and give me good children and give me a good body and give me good education give me this and give me that. So Durga gives. And then what does she do? She takes it back slowly. And this makes people go crazy. <laughs> when she takes it back slowly, or if she has real mercy, she'll take it back at one time, like with an earth earthquake or a tsunami or a hurricane. But normally she takes it back slowly until people are completely devastated. Now we're watching it right now. Like for example, previously there was the example of the Shah of Iran. He was so powerful, one of the most powerful men in the whole world during his time, and he lost everything. Right. And, and finally he died uh, in, in misery. Now we're seeing it again. We have a president who, is, who was so successful and now he's lost everything, you see. So, this is what happens when we are getting material benefits uh, based on sense gratification. They're always followed by misery. But that's to teach us that we were going after the wrong thing in the wrong way. Is there a right thing, is there a right way to go after something wrong? No, that's also wrong. But there is right and wrong in every endeavor of our life. So Krishna teaches us in two ways, by rewarding us with wisdom of the Bhagavad Gita and giving us the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra simply by chanting the Maha Mantra sincerely, you can go back to Godhead in this lifetime, complete, become completely free from the cycle of birth and death. And he gives us uh, transcendental persons like Srila Prabhupada, who gives us all this knowledge in the form of Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam and has established temples like this temple so that people can come and hear the correct message of Bhagavad Gita. All these things he gives, but there are other people who are not interested in all these wonderful gifts, so for them, he rewards them, he gives them a way to get material benefit, and then his agents take it away, and people go crazy, and they get frustrated, and they think, why is this happening to me? And if they're fortunate, They'll meet a devotee, and the devotee will be able to explain, like I'm explaining right now, why people suffer. Now, Prabhupada speaks very, uh, let's say, thoroughly about why they're suffering. In a letter he wrote in 1970 to a Mr. Uh, to a Mr. Sriman Vyasaji, 
and he said, in the Srimad Bhagavatam, there's a question asked by Parikshit Maharaj to Sukadev Goswami. So that's what we're reading now about Maharaj Parikshit. And, and, uh, and, and he says, on sinful activities in human society, as a learned professor, you will understand it very easily why a man is addicted to sinful activities. A person knows in two ways the after effects of sinful activities. Just like a criminal has heard from lawyers that a thief is punished for his criminal activities, and he has seen also that a thief is arrested by the police and put into jail. Generally, our experience is gathered by hearing and by seeing personally. The question was why a sinful man commits sinful activities, although he has full knowledge of the after result by knowing it from authority and by seeing it personally. A thief commits theft, uh, a thief commits theft repeatedly and is imprisoned repeatedly, and he has full knowledge of it. Then what is the cause of his putting himself into miserable condition of prison life? The cause is diagnosed by Vedic Acharyas as the Papa Bija, or the seed of sinful activities. This Papa Bija remains dormant. Papa means the seed of sin. Bija means seed, and Papa means sin. By the way, uh, I remember when the Pope came to Paris, this is a long time ago, and I went to see him right in the center of Paris in front of the uh, the mayor's mansion, and there were like maybe 20,000 people there. Now, in Italy, the, the uh, affectionate name of the Pope is Papa. So people were saying, Papa, 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 Papa. <laughs> Which in Sanskrit means sin. <laughs> I was really surprised. Uh, it was very, it was very, very uh, let's see, shocking in one sense. Anyway, uh, the cause is diagnosed by Vedic Acharyas as the Papa Bija, or the seed of sinful activities. This Papa Bija remains dormant within our heart in three stages. It has a dormant stage, a seedling stage, and a fructified stage. This chain of different stages of our Papa Bija is the cause of repeated birth and death, transmigration in different species of life. Actually, this is the cause of suffering of the living entities. Okay, now I'm gonna explain in depth what is Papa Bija. Papa Bija is after we have a full life in which we committed some sins and we got the reactions to those sins which do not appear at first, but later on mature. And in the, in the first stages of maturation, we have bad dreams, we have uncontrollable material desires, and we have a uh, strong feeling of lust and sometimes anger and greed. And then the mature effects come into place. Uh, someone can be born ugly, someone may be poor, someone might not have ed good education, someone might have a congenital disease, sometimes one is born with it and sometimes one develops one uh, by bad habits in life. Uh, so at first, the sinful reaction is unseen, that's called uh, parabda, uh, parabda, and then it's seen, a parabda. So, uh, and then after that, when we die, the tendency to sin remains because we have not purified ourselves to Krishna consciousness. That tendency to sin is called Papa Bija uh, or Kutum. It's a subtle thing. And when we uh, take our next birth, uh, when we, especially when we come to puberty, that's when the Papa Bija begins to uh, act on us and we begin to get attracted to things that we were not attracted to when we were younger in our infancy. But then we become attracted to rat music. I call it rat music. Like that, you, know, you become a rat by listening to it. 
and, uh, and you become attracted to all kinds of things, you know, gender neutrality or changing your gender or this thing or that thing. So uh, this Papa Bija is a subtle thing. But as long, see, you do not destroy a seed by watering it. You, you bring it, uh, activate it. But if you fry a seed, you destroy it. So, by worshiping the demigods, you, uh, you, it's like putting water on the seed. You, you just activate it. Right? However, by associating with devotees, devotees are killers. They're, they're murderers. But they don't murder the flesh. They murder the desire to sin. A devotee is an expert at killing someone's desire to sin. But only a devotee who has killed their own desire to sin is able to kill somebody else's desire to sin. They don't kill the body. They don't kill the person. They're not mean. They're not, uh, you know, uh, abusive. They kill with love. Love is the strongest uh, emotion and, and the strongest power in the world. The power of love always overcomes evil. Evil triumphs at first, but in the long term, it's defeated by love and devotion. So, actually, this is the cause of suffering living entities. There are many processes for delivering the living entity from this life of entanglement. Generally, it is summarized in the process of meditation, performances of great sacrifices, and worshiping the Lord in the temple. But in this age of Kali, Kali Yuga, age of hypocrisy and quarrel, nobody can meditate perfectly. Neither they have sufficient resources for performing great sacrifices. Neither they have tendency to attend spiritual services in the temple, churches, or mosques, or any such sanctuaries. Therefore, in the Brihad Naradiya Purana, it is stated that none of these three principles of spiritual upliftment is possible to perform in this age of Kali. Therefore, the only possible means of spiritual realization is chanting the holy name of God, or Krishna, or Rama. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Lord Chaitanya propagated this formula of spiritual realization 500 years ago. And by his grace, now it is introduced in the Western world. And practically, we are experiencing that it is effective. The Krishna consciousness movement is being popularized here by three principles. By temple worship, by sending Sankirtan party for chanting in the streets, and by distribution of small booklets or books. Okay, so this is Prabhupada's letter in 1970. Do you think that he succeeded? What is your opinion? Mm -hmm. uh, and he only did what, what he's written here. He only did what he's, what he's writing, what he's written here. He succeeded tremendously. He's one of the most successful people of the 20th century. If you just count success, he started with nothing, with $7. He came to the United States and a few books and a few grains and, uh, and lentils, and he built this gigantic movement in 11 years, 10 and a half years. And he set up a system by which it's continuing to grow, you see? So he is one of the most successful people in the whole 20th century. And he's definitely one of the most successful acharyas in the, in the uh, Brahma uh, Gaudiya Mad, uh, Sampradaya. Yeah. So, therefore, uh, this is what we're going to talk about today. Are there any questions? It's never possible. But I think most people they call Father Papa. Yeah, Krishna, Krishna. This affectionate. All the time. Don't you? Most of the culture they call Father Papa. As in India too. When they use that word, I mean, it's just uh, so many words in Sanskrit. In, in different languages, but they express different things. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? That was a comment. <laughs> <laughs> Short comment. <laughs>
Okay, no question. Uh, no, there's a question. Ahead. I have a question. Oh. Wait, wait. Mm. You have to come up here to speak in the microphone so the people are listening on the internet can hear. Any questions from the internet? Go ahead. Don would like to ask about 640 again. Okay, we'll go to it. Go ahead. So, Maharaj, when <coughs> gopis were praying to Katyani to get Krishna as an husband, so. Let's say that again. When Vraja Gopis, yes. when they were praying to Katyani or doing a Surya. Katyayani. Yeah. Durga. Yeah. So, I, is this okay? Because they were praying to get Krishna as an husband. So, is it is it is it a good thing like or like pray to demigod to advance in devotions or get Krishna? Like, what is the what is the message there actually? Well, demigods can act in two ways. One is they supply material things for people's welfare, right? So if you approach a demigod with material desires, you might get them. And it's not always guaranteed that you're going to get anything. You'll get it up to what your karma from previous life uh, has earned you. It doesn't go beyond that. But if you approach a demigod to have Krishna as, uh, to be able to worship Krishna or to advance in spiritual life and Krishna consciousness, they act as a guru and they encourage it. So uh, just like we are approaching Prabhupada. Now, he, some people approach Prabhupada for material benefits. And sometimes he may give, sometimes he may not give. Just like there was this one person who was in jail in uh, Mumbai, and he received a Back to Godhead magazine. And he was looking at it, and there was a picture of Prabhupada, and he saw that Prabhupada had a really nice watch. So he decided that when he would get out of jail, he would go and meet Prabhupada and steal the watch. It's a true story. And when he got out of jail, he did exactly that. He went to Juhu Beach, and that was in the beginning when the, the, it wasn't completely finished, but Prabhupada's room was there, and that was not completely finished, but he, he insisted on staying in that room and not in somebody's house or in a hotel. And this person spoke to the devotees, and the devotees said, you can't see Prabhupada, he doesn't know who you are, you're not initiated. But he insisted so much, and eventually he was given the right to go into Prabhupada's room and sit across from his desk and talk to him. And when they were talking, at, at one point Prabhupada asked him, why did you come here? And the person was so impressed by Prabhupada, his gentleness, his niceness, he says, well, actually, I'm a thief. And I got one of your magazines, and I saw your picture, I saw you had this watch on, and I thought I would come here and steal the watch. Prabhupada took his watch off <laughs> and gave it to him. And he was shocked. And he became a devotee and is still a devotee in Mumbai. He, he, he got into movies and he's helped the, the, the temple in, in, in very many, many ways. And he uh, was working also and made the, the restaurant very popular and so forth. Haridas. What's his name? Haridas. Haridas, yeah. I met him uh, also. So here we see sometimes the spiritual master will give a material benefit. But uh, so the demigods, if you go for a material benefit, they'll give it to you. But Prabhupada also gave, along with the watch, the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. That's something that the demigods won't do. The, so therefore it says, Akama Sarvakama Va Moksa Kama Udariti Tivrina Bhakti Yogina Yajita and so forth. It says that whether you have no material desires or whether you have all material desires, it's better to go to Krishna. Because if Krishna satisfies your material desires, you'll also get the association of devotees, Bhagavad Gita, the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, and you have a chance to purify your material desires and change them to spiritual desires to please the Lord. 
So it's always beneficial to go to Krishna or his devotee, even if you're going with a material desire. Because at least in the association of devotees, there's a chance that you can purify your desires. But there's no chance by going to the demigods for material desires. Okay. So now, now for or ordinary people, it's just the opposite because we're not supposed to um, to approach the um, demigods. But we see the gopis they're approaching Katyayani. And so although they their motive is, is uh, noble, but still they could have worshipped Narayan why they to go to Katyayani. Because it was traditional and also they, they didn't go for a material desire. Wanting Krishna is not a material desire. Yeah, yeah. But I say. So that's different. You go to a demigod with the desire to come closer to Krishna, then they act like a guru, and they bless you so you can do that. But you go to them for a material desire, they give it to you, but the, the, there's nothing that comes with it that can purify you. Hmm. Okay, so, yes. Um, so, one devotee asks, as material benedictions are taken away as per the wear Ferris wheel syndrome, does that happen with devotional service as well? Can the desire for devotional service in someone be taken away? Well, Krishna guarantees to protect the devotee. Uh, so, the Shema, Yoga and Shema, he makes approaching Krishna easy for the devotee. And once one uh, approaches Krishna and, and surrenders, he protects the devotee in order not to fall down. And if they do fall down, uh, he inspires other devotees to help them come back to Krishna consciousness. So that's, it's different than uh, just a person who wants material desires and, uh, and gets them, and then eventually they lose everything and they come, <coughs> come back again to continue material existence. Uh, the, the relationship with the spiritual master is very special. The spiritual master promises the disciple that he will come back even birth after birth if the disciple hasn't achieved liberation from the cycle of birth and death. So it's a very solemn uh, vow of uh, relationship between the guru and the disciple. So you don't get that in, in other relationships where someone's willing to come back birth after birth to, to help you overcome your material desires and develop pure desires to please Krishna. Okay, so we'll stop right there. Thank you very much. All glories to Srila Prabhupada.